Ere I saw a dappled wonder settling across the fields, hovering on angel wings, brandishing a blazing shield. Where do they go? The ones that run away and never return. There is nothing here but suffering. Pain and suffering. It is time to go. The girl in that bulletin is wanted for the murder of a child. Man lost my mom. Then me. Ain't no way he ever given up on finding me. There's anger in you. It'll fuel you, yes, but what's the worst kind of fuel? The worst kind. Savagery a man is capable of. When he believes his cause to be just. came all this way on the railroad. Yeah. And left behind all those people. Mm -hmm. What's their name? To make the Underground Railroad, Amazon's powerful original limited series based on Colson Whitehead's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, Oscar winner Barry Jenkins reassembled many members of his core filmmaking team, including editor Joy McMillan and supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer Annalie Blank. Joy McMillan has known Jenkins since they were students at the Florida State University College of Motion Picture Arts and collaborated with him on several productions, including Moonlight, for which he earned an Oscar nomination alongside editor and fellow Florida State alum Nat Sanders. With that achievement, she became the first black woman to earn an Academy Award nomination in film editing. Joy and Onely Blank also worked with Jenkins on If Beale Street Could Talk, his film adaptation of the James Baldwin novel, and will reteam with the director on his Lion King prequel. Onely Blank is also a five-time Emmy-winning mixer for HBO's Game of Thrones. In this episode of Behind the Screen, Joy and Onely discuss working with Jenkins and the making of the Underground Railroad. The series' remarkable cast is led by Tuso and Bedu as Cora Randall, a slave who flees her Georgia plantation using the Underground Railroad, which is portrayed as a rail system. The cast also includes Joel Edgerton as slave hunter Ridgway, Chase W. Dillon as Homer, a black child who is Ridgway's assistant, and Sheila Adam as Cora's mother, Mabel. I'm Carolyn Jardina. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporters Behind the Screen. So congratulations to both of you and everyone who worked on the series. As I understand it, Barry had wanted to work with this material for quite some time. And uh, Joy, I believe you read Colson Whitehead's novel quite a few years ago. Uh, would you tell us about the genesis of the production? Yeah. So I believe the first time Barry mentioned um, Underground Railroad to me was around uh, spring of 2017. And um, basically, you know, as things were taking off with Moonlight, Barry had already had in mind these like two projects, If Bill Street Could Talk and um, The Underground Railroad. And it was just a, a matter of knowing which one was actually going to go first. And so I had, um, you know, The Underground Railroad on my radar and had taken the time to read the book. And yeah, it's been a journey. It's been, I would say, what, oh, three or four years now. Um, that we finally were, um, got the opportunity to finally see it to fruition. Annalie, was it a similar time frame for you? I was in the middle of doing Beale Street when Joy and Barry said that they were going to do Underground Railroad next. And I was very excited because being a sound person, I go, ooh, there's so many cool things that we can do with sound. Set in the South, there's a train, it's a time period piece. And just knowing that it's a Barry Jenkins project and the whole team that's involved, um, who are all his friends that now are my friends, it just, you know, it's a great collaboration. It's going to be a beautiful art piece. I'm very excited. A couple years for me. Not quite four years. 
<laughs> well, now you, you, you both have been working with Barry and the team really for quite a number of years now. Um, Joy, you actually go back to Florida State University with uh, Barry and cinematographer James Laxton and some of the others. Would the both of you talk just about the collaboration between the whole team? Yeah, so I've known, um, so in my class at Florida State University in film school was Barry Jenkins, uh, James Laxton, our cinematographer, and Mark Syriac, who's one of our um, producers and is a, a partner at Pastel, um, Barry's company. And um, and then the class below us was Adela Romanski, who's also a producer and a partner in Pastel. And so, yeah, we've actually known each other for, I don't don't want to date us because then people are <laughs> trying to do the math. But, you know, Barry's very candid about us. He's like, I've known these people for 20 years. I'm like, okay, okay, okay now they can do the math. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we've known each other um, for quite some time. And I will say, like, so many people always ask me, like, how have they changed? How are they different? And I'll say each of these people have, you know, become a part of my family. And um, I think we've had this ability to love and support each other and trust in each other and our abilities um, and which has made our whole progression, you know, through this whole entire process so much more enriching to be able to share that with people who you're so close with. Um, and I think that is definitely reflected in our collaboration, um, you know, because we have such a trust for one each other, for, because we have such a trust for each other, um, I think it enables us to know that what we put forth is probably the best thing that we could ever put forth because we know that each of us is giving our all um, in the work. The first time I met Joy was in 2010, wandering the hallways of Tadeo. And immediately I was, I loved the way that she dressed and her style. And so I was like, we should be friends and go shopping. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, I have this, this short film that uh, maybe you could mix it. It's for my friend Barry. And I go, okay. And so that was in like two, 2011, I think chlorophyll was. And that's when I met Barry. And I was just blown away by his whole deposition, the way he talked about film. I was blown away by Barry and Joy's friendship. It just was really wonderful vibe to be a part of. And, um, and I'm really glad that I still get to work with them. <laughs> they still hire me. <laughs> so, uh, let's, let's get into the editing. Um, so Joy, uh, this is a 10 episode series and, um, it had to feel like one consistent story. So would you describe your initial approach to, um, you know, just the pacing and the storytelling? Yeah. I first have to give, you know, a shout out to my partner in crime, Alex O'Flynn, who is the other editor on this project. He just did such an outstanding job. And I think one of the things that really made it work was that as editors, our sensibilities are so in step with one another. And so um, I was so happy that he could work with us on this project. And um I think Barry, too, was really, really happy to have him aboard. And also Daniel, my assistant, um, but he edited an episode on this. He edited Fanny Briggs, and he also edited all of our teasers that Barry put out. So I have to shout out to both of them because they did an amazing job. Um, and, yeah, in the process of editing, it was one of those things where um, I've never done – you know, uh, a show that has 10 episodes and I've never done a show for a streaming service. So this was my first time where we, you know, they decided that all the episodes were going to come out at the same time, which was, I think, a blessing because we had, we were able to, when we were putting the episodes together, we were able to focus specifically on each episode, but we also had the opportunity for the episodes that took place later in the story to kind of inform us on what we need to preserve and make sure is accessible in the earlier episodes. Um, and so it was very interesting because I was working on the first episode, Georgia, 
and the last um, chapter, Mabel, at the same time. <laughs> I was like, well, this is very interesting to work, you know, on the beginning and the ending. But I think because I had access to both of those at the same time, I think we were really, um, we had the ability to really hone in and make sure that through line of Cora and Mabel is relevant and woven into the story. So then when we do get to the end, it is rewarding. The performances were extraordinary. Would you talk about shaping the performances? Of, why don't we talk about Cora? Yeah, too so, too so, too so. I, you know, I. Um, it's it's one of those things where, as an editor, when you're working um, on you know a film or a television show, and an actor comes you know across in such a powerful way that you're just excited for the world to get to meet them. And, you know, Tuso was uh, already, you know, a bright shining star in her own right um, in South Africa. And so this is kind of her introductory to, um, you know, American audiences. And so I was just blown away by what, by what she was able to give to the character Cora. Um, so nuanced, so focused. And also, I think her ability to adapt because, you know, when you start off in Georgia, she then goes to another state and it's like another group of people that she's had to interact with. And so her ability to welcome each of these characters into her life and to be able to perform and interact with them and, ha and build these relationships that feel so authentic, I was just, you know, so impressed by her. Um, and I, I think everyone else is realizing what a powerhouse she truly is. And another character who had such a presence was uh, Chase Dillon, who plays Homer. Yes. Tell us about working with him. I, you know, I had the pleasure of meeting Chase on set when I went down to Atlanta, and he is just a presence. So delightful, so kind, so personable, and very, very inquisitive. Um, but it's, you know, the moment that Barry would call action, he just snapped into that character that it's, it's, it's hard because he is a child, you know, <laughs> and I think a lot of people, um, don't understand why they dislike a child so much, but man, the character Homer, I was always, that was like, I think that was the main character. I was so interested in seeing who was going to play them because I had such a, like a vivid vision of who Homer was and what he looked like. And I remember when I first got that camera test footage and we was, he was, Joel was in a chair and Chase was standing next to him in his little three piece suit and his little bowler hat. And I was like, wow, yeah, that's Homer. Um, and I think one of the things that I love about Chase and his performance is he's present even when he's not speaking. So as an editor, I had so many opportunities to use his reactions which is so helpful when you're putting together a scene. Um, and he always was very present and always, you know, gave 100% when it was time, um, when the camera started rolling. What do you hope people take away from this story? Oh, so much. <laughs> I would say, like, I, you know, there have been a lot of people who say, not another slave narrative. Why can't we have a rom-com? You know, why can't we be in space? And I think for me, you have to know where you came from in order to get where you're going. And I think what the, the importance of telling stories, not only telling our stories in our history, but telling them in this way is acknowledging that like our past did happen um, but these people were resilient, you know, and they never lost hope. And that's one of the things that I think um, Barry did such a good job of shining a light on the humanity and the dignity that these people had to possess in order to keep going. And I think that's the biggest takeaway from this, this series is the importance to not dehumanize a group of people who survived in spite of but to shine a light on the humanity and dignity of these people that survived through something that a lot of people could have lost hope. A lot of people could have given up, but they decided to keep going. And I think that's something that should definitely be celebrated and remembered. Nothing 
was given. All was earned. Annalie, let's talk about the soundscape. Um, it, it is so distinct in this series. What did you and Barry initially discuss that you wanted it to be? And would you also talk about creating that uh, delicate balance between the sound and Nick's score? It was funny. Um, I, I started collecting sounds and, and figuring out what the show might sound like from the script phase and when Joy started getting some scenes together, even in the early, early versions, she would send them over to me. And I would send back earlier, early versions of basic ideas just to sort of get the creative juices flowing and to get feedback from Joy as well. Um, I didn't, it was more like I was working one-on-one -on -one with Joy <laughs> for <laughs> a very wonderful long time. Mm -hmm until Barry was finished shooting. Um, he was so busy directing all of these episodes and in a, in a very intense headspace that I didn't want to bother him on like, hey, check out my cricket sound. <laughs> you think he's, he just has a lot to deal with. So every once in a while, I'd, I'd have Joy be like, hey, can you have Barry just listen to this or can you have him listen to that and but as my job as sound supervisor and is I gathered I think one of the most amazing sound teams I've ever worked with um Harry Cohen was a sound designer he's been doing this for many years um he's done all the Quentin Tarantino movies um I also worked with Jay Jennings another fabulous sound designer Luke Giblian was our effects editor. Uh, Brian Parker, our dialogue ADR supervisor. Chris Kawadi, our dialogue editor. And we had uh, Catherine Wood, who did um, a lot of our exterior group recording that we ended up recording uh, at Harry Potter land because during COVID everything was closed. So it was quite creepy to go up there and <laughs> record for our show. Um, also we had Benjamin Cook and Shauna C. Hare, who's a part of our team and our Foley crew, who is amazing, who are in Finland, Heike Kossi. They ended up building full wooden structures that were to resemble an attic which is, you will see in one of the episodes, Cora and Fanny Briggs, or Grace, um, are up in an attic. And so he did an, a whole sound design scape just for Foley. What is What does the wood sound like? There wi is wind coming through the wood. And one thing that's great about working with Barry and Joy and Alex and everyone involved was... It's never done. Um, I can't, we probably did 19 versions of the opening of 101. And <laughs> and then we're like, is it done? Oh, we're just out of time, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> and what was great too is we bounced around and we, we actually mixed episode one last. And that was really a blessing because we kind of found our stride and figured out what this show is going to sound like. It's not going to sound like a regular show. We don't want it to sound just like a regular Southern show. That's easier to do. How can we make it sound more like a Southern show meets a horror movie meets a Twin Peaks vibe meets something different that has its own name. And it's really fun to work with Barry because he's like, okay, this sounds great. This sounds great. Why don't you guys break it and then redo it? And then I'll come back in and, and listen to it. And he leaves and we go, oh, man, what does it mean? Okay, let's try something else. Let's try this. Let's try that. And so it was, it was always changing and flowing. And, and every episode we wanted to sound different. We had a good idea of where it was going to go, but it never ended up exactly how I thought it was going to be in our head. So. <laughs> What were some of, the, I know you did a lot of sound recording for this. Um, what were some yeah. of the more unique sounds that you went out to get? 
Um, well, I hired this guy named Watson Wu who lives in Florida. So it was, it was great because COVID, I couldn't fly anywhere to record. Um, so he, there's a 17 year cicadas that were coming through Florida at this exact time. So, uh, he camped out in the Everglades for three nights and he put microphones all up in the trees and he got a whole soundscape of anything that could possibly be used walking through a swamp. He got chased by an alligator, um, every type of bird, um, fox calls, any, anything, uh, that he could think of, he recorded. It was painful to go through all this material, it took hours and hours of time. And then later we recorded a 1835 steam train that was being moved from one museum to another museum. Um, and that was going to be the last run that this train was ever going to do. And what was so crazy about that train is there was still an attached black slave car train to that train. And the fact that you can still go and see that really makes you think, wow, this wasn't very long ago. And this is really, really disturbing to see in present day. Um, but we recorded it and that's, that train is the, what you hear in the show. And we also morph the train sounds to make them be like wind. And any, anytime you hear a low end, anything in Mabel, that is our train. It's not wind. So it was fun to try to use these train sounds in other ways. Just to find that must have involved a lot of research. Do you want to talk about that? So it's interesting. This guy, Watson Wu, he only does recording. That's his job. And he taught, he was friends with someone who works in the train business. He's like, hey, you should call this museum. So we called this museum. And at first they said, you can't record any of the trains. They're put, they're not moving. We're not doing that. And then they got a call saying, on this date, we're actually moving the train to a different museum. So we got everything down there, got microphones all along the tracks, and had one one shot to record it, which which worked. And it took three conductors to run that train. It was so big and just massive and old. And it was fun to it was fun to get, but in the library. And I've got to ask, you referred to an alligator incident? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he heard something in the, the bushes and he saw he saw an alligator running straight for him. So he climbed a tree. And then the alligator just kept walking the road. And he called me. He's like, man, I almost got taken out by an alligator. And my response was, well, did you get it on recording? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I actually well, used some of that sound in it just for some brush movement. You know, anything that we can use that we recorded, we tried to use. Obviously, some stuff is more of a memory than actually getting into the show, but we used a lot of material. I will have to say that Anna is so dedicated to sound that even when her baby was born, was it Fena? Didn't you record her sound and we use it in Beale Street? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Like, even giving birth, Anna's like, I'm going to record this sound. Even giving birth, I was like, get the recorder. <laughs> <laughs> like, recording the screening like, TV. I was like, perfect. <laughs> I just, I love when she told me that. I was like, of course, Anna, of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we didn't need to put that in, in uh, our show since we had such a good baby recording. Already, so yes, yeah. <laughs> that was good. That was a good one. This was probably the hardest thing I've ever worked on. It just took all my time. I it just just like Joy said, yeah. it was one of the hardest things. Just I remember at the beginning, I called Joy. I'm like, "How do you work on this every day?" I mean, I'm getting really down. She goes, "You just have to put it in its own space." And you just mm -hmm. didn't have to move about your day. I go, okay. So, yeah. and it was really interesting working in that space for so long. And then I watched episode one with 
my mom and dad and my mom was just freaking out. She said, I don't think I can take this. I don't think I can watch this. I was like, oh my gosh, that's right. I used to feel the same way. So interesting when you put it in its space and know it's like, it's a job. It, you know, it's, it, it was the only way to get through working on this for so long. Yeah. Cause it, it is, it, you know, it's one of those things where um, I think Tusa was talking about how she had to say goodbye to Cora and it took her some time to actually do that just because you've lived with this person for so long and you've had to go through these experiences as her to completely divorce yourself from that instantly. It's just not possible. And that's one of the things is like, you know, working on this show and being in a pandemic where you're just going into work, coming home, and you don't have that escapism of meeting up a friend, meeting up with a friend for dinner or grabbing a coffee. You're kind of even more isolated with the material that you did have to fi- figure out a way to preserve yourself and your sanity by looking at it like this is my job. It's very technical. I can't be thinking about, you know, Mabel and Cora and Polly. But you do have to allow yourself to care for these characters, um, you know. And I definitely did. You know, I will still always in my heart have a place for Mabel and Cora and Polly and all of these people that we're representing on the screen. Um, because like Barry says, they're our ancestors. That's what they represent. And we can't forget them. Um, but you do, at, at a certain point, have to say goodbye to them and move on with your life because, you know, it is a very, very heavy subject matter um, that can occupy a lot of your mental space if you allow it to. So, Joy, do you want to pick one scene from one of the episodes? Is there one that, you know, really stayed with you longer than some of the others? Oof. It was really, it was one of those things where... Um, in episode or in chapter 10, when Mabel just has her little break with reality. Um, and I just remember reading it in the script and understanding that something so horrific like that happening and her having the insight intuition and trying to tell people that this is a possibility and no one listening to her. I really wanted to do justice to that moment of her just being overwhelmed with the information that she had, how she had to find her best friend. And I wanted to put the audience in her perspective of how that feels. Um, And oftentimes when you see something very horrific or traumatic, um, it doesn't really live in your psyche or in your memory as like a full on scene. You know, you don't like you don't like see it in a wide shot or see it, you know, in these close ups. But it's like trying to piece back together something that your your mind is almost rejecting. Um, and so I remember early on talking to Anna about that scrubbing sound when Mabel's scrubbing, and those images keep on like keep on peeking in, even though she doesn't want to think about it, even though she's just trying to clean up, you know, the mess her mind can't shut off what just happened and she just snaps. And so that was to me, it was such an important moment, but I love how visually with the editing, with the sound design and um, with the score, we were able to detail so specifically where Mabel is in that moment and drop the audience into her experience. Um, And that to me, was definitely something that I think we were very successful with. Um, and it is a very emotional moment. Um, but there's something so authentic about that moment that I know Barry was striving for. And I think we were um, quite successful with it. I remember it vividly. Um, do you want to elaborate on the sound work for the, that scene? Yeah, I I don't know. It's, it's so interesting because... Um, the thing that was so important with that, the way that brush was supposed to have, it was supposed to almost not sound like um, 
it was almost like it was kind of how I guess Anna could speak to it too, but it was kind of how we also played with the cicadas in the moment where everything goes quiet and all you're hearing are the cicadas. But that that the brushing was just supposed to get slowly but surely louder and louder and louder. And it was also supposed to enhance the moment where when we cut the brushing is supposed to be as jarring and and kind of emphasizing Mabel's like break with reality. So I, it was one of the things like we, I remember working on the mix with Anna and Matt and saying like, you know, it needs to, it almost needs to, you, you shouldn't hear the brushing ever stop. It's this driving, haunting percussion of brush against wood that almost is, you know, driving the audience crazy a little bit by, you know, like the constant sound of it. And then when it drops out and Mabel just stands up, it was just so impactful. And to me, I, I like it's one of the things I love the film Three Colors Blue. Um, and the opening of that film always gets me because I feel like it's kind of the, the best example of like the harmony of camera, sound, music, editing, everything's working in sync. And I think, you know, this section of chapter 10 is one of those moments where I feel like everything is working in sync and everything is working towards this achievement of demonstrating her break with reality. Yeah, we worked on that scene quite a bit. Yeah, we did. (laughs) And, you know, that, that part is so powerful. And the full, the Foley guys knocked it out of the park and Matt used a lot of mixing tricks um, and techniques to build it like it was getting louder, but it technically wasn't. It was just using the Atmos and different speakers panning situation. And so then when you really hear it cut out, you only hear her breath. Um, Throughout that whole episode, hearing Mabel's breath is almost like her own character and um you know uh how can we create this horror of slavery but paint it like it's coming from inside her mind where were you in the post-production process when you began working remotely and how did the i mean you two obviously worked very close together how did you accomplish that during that time yeah so we were um i think the moment that the world shut down, was it March 15th, 2020? Right. 2019. Yeah. yeah 2020. Uh, or sorry, was it 2019? Oh, 2020. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like my, year, my years are running together. Um, yeah, I remember we had three days left of shooting and production, and I just I kept checking in on Barry, and I was just praying. I was like, oh, let us get those last three days before the world shuts down. And, of course, we didn't get those last three days. Um And so production was shut down and then we quickly had to get um, our systems that for everyone to work remotely that week. And because everyone else was working remotely, I was able just to go into the office by myself. And so I would say I worked probably from March to June by myself. And then, um, and then Amazon put in place our, weekly testing um, to allow, you know, um, the other editor, Alex and Daniel um, and Israel, our assistant editor and Matt Willard, um, our other assistant editor to come back into the offices, which was so refreshing because working by yourself in this gigantic office and you look around and it almost felt like, I remember Barry commenting on it and it says, it feels a little apocalyptic. Like everyone just like was moving into the office and just disappeared. Cause we had actually had just, we were in the, the um, we were in the process of transitioning from our old office to our biggest office building, um, our bigger office building. And we never fully got to work in the office building as a full team because of the pandemic. Um, Cause our um, post producer, Sean Peterson, Post supervisor Chiara Rivera and our post coordinator Joe um, had to work from home, and they never actually got to work in the office with us. So, yeah, 
Um, but the thing that was really cool is that we still got to go into the mix stage, which I was so thankful for, because um, I really, really knew it was important for us to be able to be in, on the mix stage. And sound is so important, of, is, is such an important part of our process that I was hoping and praying that we would have the ability to actually be in there with um, Anna and Matt once the mixing started. And um, thankfully, we were able to. We actually felt safer being on the mix stage than just out there in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Which know, is very no true. <laughs> yes, we actually we actually just became a little post production family because those were that's basically the only people we got to see were the people we were working with. So, Anna, do you just from a creative standpoint want to talk a little bit about the mix? Yeah, so we we started mixing in September. And we finished at the end of January. Um, and once you start mixing, we did not stop. We didn't take days off. I mean, we took, we took weekends off, but Monday through Friday and it would always change. Oh, we're working on 101 today. Cool. Tomorrow. Oh, we're gonna work on 103. Why? Joy wants us to work on 103. Okay, cool. (laughs) (laughs) And so from a sound editorial standpoint, I had a feeling that was going to happen just based off of the nature of the show, looking at how big the scope of it was, realizing that different visual effects and music might come in at different times. So I wanted to make sure that the first six episodes were completely ready to mix before we hit the mix stage. Um, And there was still some shuffling back and forth, but that's why you have a good team in place. And that was the first time that um, a couple of my sound editors, we actually got to work in the same room together because everybody was working remotely at home. I was working at going into Warner Brothers, but that, that was it. So, yeah, once we started mixing, it was it was pretty exhausting because I would mix and then go home at night and listen to stuff that we're preparing for the next day and then mix and then it was and then repeat and then repeat. So when uh, the show was actually over and I had a couple of days off, I'm like, what do I do? Like, you know, <laughs> you're probably like that too, Joy. You're like, oh, I guess I'll, <laughs> I guess I'll relax. You know, I'm like, how do you do that? You have to relearn how to not work at this, you know, intense level. Yeah. It, it does take some getting used to, to be like, oh, I can go for a walk today. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, de- but definitely worth, um, well worth all the hard work. Um, yeah. I don't think I could be any more proud of the show and what we were able to accomplish. Um, it, you know, I, take a step back and look at, you know, all of the, you know, the individual details and all the individual department, like Mark Friedberg, our production designer, Carolyn Eslin, our costume designer, just, you know, everyone was functioning at such a high level that um, it really, really, really is, you know, something that I couldn't be more proud of and couldn't be more proud of the individuals I had, you know, the opportunity to work with. It's pretty spectacular. Well, congratulations to both of you on the series. Before we wrap up, let's um, just look ahead a bit. You're both working on Barry's next project, which is the prequel to The Lion King. Uh, What can you tell us about that? A lot of hard work. Um, no, it's 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 really cool to be able to collaborate on something so different from what we just finished um, and look around and it's, you know, it's some of your favorite people that you get the opportunity to work with again. Um, and, you know, Anna and I have already been talking about sounds <laughs> with Perry because um, they really get to play on this one, uh, which mm-hmm. will be very, very exciting. Um, one of my favorite noises that we did in the Underground Railroad is this um, bullfrog noise that they treated. And I was like, are bullfrogs going to make it into the lake? <laughs> <laughs> we'll put them in. <laughs> so we'll see. 
Um, but yeah, it's actually just been um, a lot of fun to see the whole progression. We're at really, really early days, and so um, not a ton to report, but um, I'm excited for what we're working on. I really love the story, um, a lot of new characters, and um, I think it will be... Um, I think it'll be a lot different than people are thinking it's going to be. So that's cool. Yeah. Lots of recording. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for joining us on Behind the Screen. Thank you. Thanks for having us. This was a pleasure. 